Our guest today is MIT linguistics professor and leading critic of U.S. foreign policy, Noam Chomsky. Professor Chomsky has been in the news a lot recently, since Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez held up his book, Hegemony or Survival, in front of the U.N. Security Council last week and recommended reading it to understand the United States foreign policy. It now tops the bestseller list over at Amazon.com. In Chomsky's follow-up book, Failed States, the Abuse of Power and the Assault on Democracy, he says that America fails to protect its citizens from violence and that there's a very big gap between public policy and public opinion. The U.S. has intervened militarily in failed states around the globe, such as Haiti and Iraq, but Noam Chomsky charges that rather than promoting democracy, we are the leading example of a failed state. If you have a question or comment for Noam Chomsky, we'll have the lines open for the rest of the hour, you can give us a call at 415-841-4134, 415-841-4134. The toll-free number is 866-798-8255. That's 866-798-8255. Noam Chomsky joins us this morning from his office at MIT. Welcome, Professor Chomsky. Quite glad to be with you. Thanks for having us. I want to ask you, I'm sure you've been asked this many, many times, but last week... Hugo Chavez held up your book, Hegemony or Survival, in front of the U.N. and told people that they should read it to understand the American government. And it quickly went to the top of the Amazon.com bestseller list. What did you think of what Hugo Chavez said and then the, the, the aftermath of his statement? Well, those are two different questions. Uh, it's uh, inter There was a huge amount of coverage of it. But it's, and of course I haven't read everything, but uh, what I read, a substantial amount, systematically avoided what he said. Uh, he said quite a lot of things. He gave uh, his most important address, of course, was the one at the Security Council. I haven't even seen a reference to that. Uh, the only reference was to the talk at the General Assembly. Uh, and it was noted in passing, I think the New York Times had a phrase uh, saying that uh, there was prolonged applause, uh, uh, so uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, out strong that the chair had to cancel it. Well, there may be a reason for that, but I didn't see any investigation of the reason or of what he said, except for you know, some some of his uh, rather extreme rhetoric, which I don't like and don't think he should have used, but it doesn't matter. I mean, there's much worse rhetoric that comes from Donald Rumsfeld and George Bush and Nancy Pelosi and others uh, concerning him. But I don't care about that either, whatever. The rhetoric isn't interesting. What's interesting is the uh, the substance, the policies, and the actions. Uh, but that was systematically ignored. So his uh, discussion at the, uh, the, the reason for the applause, almost certainly, uh, was that he was the views that he was expressing, which are regarded here as extremist, are regarded in the world as pretty mainstream. Uh, that's the reason for the applause. Uh, so, for example, when he describes the uh, United States as uh, maybe the leading uh, threat to world peace, he's simply reflecting global opinion. Uh, you can find that out in uh, the major U.S. run polls by. Uh, Pew Research Foundation or the Harris Interactive Polls and so on. What they find is that even in Europe, uh, the region which is mo tends to be most supportive of Washington, uh, the U.S. is in the lead uh, in the population among, when ranked among among the countries they listed uh, when ranked uh, as a threat to world peace. Uh, the only reason it's completely in the lead, I suspect, is that they didn't include Israel in the list. In past polls, Israel has been ranked that way in, each, in the United States and Europe. This time, it's uh, the United States. Uh, Iran is well behind. Uh, others, like uh, Russia and China, are very low, and even North Korea is very low. Well, that happens to be world opinion. Uh, we can't call that an extremist position unless we assume that everything uh, outside the United States is extremist. And we're uh, either they march in step and join official doctrine here, or they're extremists. That's an interesting point of view, but it hasn't been made explicit uh, for pretty obvious reasons. Uh, his talk at the Security Council uh, had no inflammatory rhetoric uh, and was highly substantive. He talked about real issues, 
uh, some of them very closely concerning Venezuela, in fact. Well, uh, it, it's interesting because a, a number of analysts said that people actually were able to laugh and clap because unlike Venezuela and maybe a few other countries, most people at the UN don't have the luxury of criticizing Bush, at least not publicly. And the, the San Francisco Chronicle had an interesting piece on Friday or last week that went deeper, um, went beyond the, the devil and the sulfur rhetoric, talking about Chavez visiting a number of states in the past two weeks and spending more in Latin America than America spends. They spent about $1.7 billion this year and single-handedly brought Argentina completely out of debt. That's true. They have done that. and I didn't see the San Francisco Chronicle report, but uh, there have been several reports about that in the U.S., and their tone was pretty critical of uh, Chavez, as if uh, he's doing something wrong. Uh, but from the point of view of Latin Americans, it's not wrong. And in fact, they omitted the... It's true, he brought up a large part of Argentina's debt. And the reason for that, uh, which is significant, is that Argentina, in the words of the president, wanted to rid itself of the IMF. Uh, IMF rules, IMF means U.S. Treasury Department, effectively, uh, they're following the rules in Argentina rigorously, had led to a, a very serious economic collapse. Uh, Kirchner, the new president, uh, decided to disregard uh, IMF rules pretty almost completely, and that led to a surprising uh, economic recovery. Now he wants to rid himself of the IMF, and uh, Chavez helped by buying up a large part of the debt. Same in Bolivia. In fact, uh, most of the continent wants to rid itself of the IMF. That means rid itself of the means of of one of the means by which the U.S. has controlled the continent. There have basically been two means. One is just violence, uh, and the other is uh, one or another form of economic control and strangulation. And they have uh, they want to rid themselves of both. That's part of a major move in Latin America for the first time since the Spanish conquests, 500 years, the first time uh, that they are moving towards a degree of independence, uh, uh, some kind of integration. They've always been very separated. And yeah, Venezuela is playing a central part in it. Uh, the, Venice, the, uh, the, Ven the Venezuela to Bolivia gas pipeline, which could, if it works out, uh, benefit all the countries of the region if it works out properly. Well, that's a constructive contribution. And it's not just in South America. I don't know if this was mentioned in the San Francisco Chronicle, but uh, Venezuela and Cuba, uh, uh, in some way, their relationship is a very natural one. Uh, they're each doing what we are, are supposed to favor, pursuing their comparative advantage. Well, that's what you're taught in schools is a good thing. Uh, Venezuela's comparative advantage is in oil wealth. Cuba's is in uh, uh, highly trained and skilled and educated personnel, uh, doctors, teachers, and so on. And they're, ex they're exchanging those two, just like you're supposed to do, according to economic theory. Uh, one of the ways they're doing it is with uh, what's called Operation Miracle in the Caribbean, mainly. Uh, Operation Miracle is a Venezuelan-funded Cuban-operated uh, 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 program in which Cuban, highly skilled Cuban doctors uh, go to Caribbean countries, like, say, Jamaica. And uh, at the moment, they're focusing on blindness, finds people who are blind but who could become uh, cured by advanced surgical procedures. They're bringing them to Cuba, curing them of advanced medicine, uh, sang them back to the countries, and they can see. Well, you know, it's a good program, and it also has an effect. Uh, people don't are impressed when uh, the friends and relatives who are blind uh, go to Cuba and with Venezuelan funding and are uh, brought back and can see. Uh, we could do that much more easily than Cuba and Venezuela could. Uh, we don't. Actually, there was apparently a sort of secret, you know, it's kind of, it's it's not done in public, so we can't be sure, but there was apparently a U.S.-Mexico uh, discussion and the beginnings of an initiative to try to counter this by a U.S.-funded program of some kind, 
but it never got off the ground. Well, I'm curious to hear your opinion on what you think is in store um, for our relationship with Venezuela. Uh, we have a tendency to sort of forget about history, um, specifically with the way the media is, is structured these days. And in your book, you write about uh, the Bush administration supporting the coup to overthrow Chavez in 2002. And the Bush administration is still supporting groups financially that oppose Chavez. And in your book, you write, the concept is interesting. While Washington's right to support anti-Chavez groups in Venezuela cannot be questioned, there might perhaps be some eyebrows raised if Iran were funding anti-Bush groups here in the United States, particularly if it did so right after having supported a military coup to overthrow the government. And when you put it in that language, you kind of step back and say, yeah, that really makes good, that makes good sense. So why isn't it in the headlines of all the newspapers? I mean, it's not quantum physics. It's obvious. You know, any 10-year-old can understand it. Uh, newspaper editors can understand it. Columnists can understand it. So why aren't they writing it? Well, there's only one reason I can think of. It's what uh, the founder of modern international relations theory, uh, Hans Morgenthau, called our conformist subservience to those in power, speaking of intellectuals. Now, can you think of another reason? I can't. <laughs> well, what about um, Iranian's president, um, Ahmadinejad? When he was at the UN, uh, it was amazing to watch the media uh, basically ignore him. I think uh, CNN had some commentary about his outfit. It, it was very strange on Wolf Blitzer, one of those shows. Um, I believe Anderson Cooper interviewed him, but we had a, a, a Friday media roundtable, and some of the guests were saying that it's the media's responsibility to give people like this a microphone rather than just focus on the rhetoric. Um, what do you think about Ahmadinejad's speech at the UN, which didn't get a lot of attention because he didn't use the rhetoric that uh, Hugo yeah. Chavez used? Well, as I say, Hugo Chavez also gave a speech without rhetoric, a much more important one at the Security Council, and I can't even find a reference to it, which had many important things to say. Uh, what it reveals, again, is uh, that the media and the intellectual community generally, I mean, we, media are part of it, simply do not want Americans to be exposed to the reality of the world. They are focusing on uh, Im imagery, uh, gossip, uh, and so on. Uh, sometimes even falsifying what's said. Like, take in my case, one of the big media issues concerning Chavez and me was uh, attributing to him the statement that uh, I had died. You know, in fact, the New York Times has actually sent a photographer here to verify that I'm alive. <laughs> the only problem with that is he didn't say it. Uh -huh. What he said is something different explicitly, unambiguously, you know, recorded and broadcast by ABC television. What he said is uh, he was sorry that he had not been able to meet John Kenneth Galbraith while he was alive. Well, why the change? You know, conceivably, it was a misunderstanding, but it's a little hard to imagine. I suspect the reason is that uh, that would have sounded too reasonable. It wouldn't fit. Uh, to someone they're trying to demonize to say that he wanted to meet a liberal icon. Uh, so, okay, maybe that's the reason. Maybe there was some other. Uh, but they didn't present what he said accurately. They ignored the content. Same with Ahmadinejad. Uh, quite independent of this is what we think about the content. But we can't know that unless it's presented. In the case of Chavez, I think uh, the content was very substantive. Ahmadinejad is a different person. I don't like either the content or the substance of what he says, but much of the world does. However, what should be mentioned is that he does not direct Iranian foreign policy. In fact, he has very little power. He has domestic power. The director of uh, Iranian foreign policy is in the hands of uh, uh, what they call the supreme leader, the Ayatollah Khamenei, and the council that's answerable to him. They are the ones responsible to foreign policy. Their positions are not presented. I mean, have you read anywhere that uh, uh, the Supreme Leader uh, declared a couple of months ago, in fact, redeclared, that Iran supports the Arab League position on Israel and Palestine? That's the position uh, that says that uh, the countries of the region should not only recognize Israel, but should normalize relations with it within a two-state settlement of the kind that the whole, practically the whole world has supported for 30 years and the U.S. and Israel have blocked. 
I didn't read that anywhere. I mean, you could find some references to it in the British business press, but not here. And that's the important statement. Uh, uh, there are many others. Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, this is a very serious problem, the conflict with Iran. It's not a trivial matter. Uh, and the serious question would be, should be asking is, are there options for a peaceful settlement? And uh, what, in fact, is the attitude of the world towards it? Uh, here we read that the so-called international community uh, is dedicated to ensuring that uh, Iran does not carry out uh, uh, uranium enrichment, as everyone agrees it's legally entitled to do, but that's the international community. Now, the only problem is that that's true only if the term international community is defined as meaning the United States and anyone who happens to support it. If you look at the actual world, it's simply not true. So the non-aligned movement, which is a huge movement, uh, uh, is... Uh, back uh, over a year ago uh, met, I think it was Malaysia, and stated uh, strongly that it favors uh, Iran's right to carry out uh, what they called its inalienable right to carry out uranium enrichment, like any other country that signed the NPT. Are they part of the international community? Well, let's take Iran's neighbors. They're significant. Professor Chomsky, hold that thought. I, I, we're going to take a quick break, and we have full lines where people are wanting to ask you questions and, and speak to you. We're talking with Noam Chomsky. He's out with a new book called Failed States, The Abuse of Power and the Assault on Democracy. If you'd like to join the conversation, give us a call at 415-841-4134. The toll-free number is 866-798-8255. We'll be back with your calls after a short break. And that is the theme to Darth Vader. We're talking with Noam Chomsky today about his new book, Failed States, The Abuse of Power and the Assault on Democracy. We have full lines. Let's go to our first caller, Ricardo in San Francisco. Ricardo, welcome to the show. Uh, hello. Uh, good morning, Rose. Good morning. Thank you for allowing me to be on with Noam Chomsky. And uh, Mr. Chomsky, good morning. Thank you. I think you're the most erudite, knowledgeable, and most reasoned political analyst in U.S. history, sir. I'd like to uh, say something on the uh, April 11, 2002 military coup in Venezuela and what happened directly after with the uh, Cardona debacle uh, presented by the CIA. And uh, Wayne Madsen, a CIA analyst, intelligence analyst, had a lot to say about that at the time. And I'd like to know where we stand right now as the view of all these analysts saying that the U.S. Southern Command is planning everything they can right now toward another coup and instrumentalizing their base in Colombia as the forefront for really seizure of an ultimate uh, oil sump in Venezuela and Lake Maracaibo. Yeah. Well, of course, they don't uh, let the population, population in on what they're doing. Uh, a very important fact to be, keep in mind about secret documents, uh, which something of which anybody who has looked at declassified documents is aware, is that for the most part, uh, the secrecy is to prevent, uh, to, 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 to uh, secure the government, to defend the government against its major enemy, which happens to be the domestic population. Uh, most of the secrecy is intended to keep government policies secret from the population because the population won't like them. Uh, that's the large, one of the major conclusions you can draw from detailed uh, reading analysis of uh, released government records. And I think the same is happening now. If, they, if, this, if, if the political elites and the economic elites wanted this to be a democratic society, which they don't for obvious reasons, uh, they would be telling us what they're planning. Uh, so we can only speculate. My own speculation is that they're not planning a military coup because I don't think they, I think they know they can't get away with it. Uh, the 2002 coup was quite interesting. Uh, uh, military coups to overthrow democratic governments in the hemisphere are, you know, have been a dime a dozen. I don't have to run through them. They're kind of like standard operating procedure. Uh, this is the first one which not only quickly failed, but where the U.S. had to back down in the face of a strong negative reaction in Latin America. 
uh, not uniform, so Chile sort of went along with it. But uh, most of Latin America was horrified and outraged. Uh, they just take democracy more seriously than we do. Didn't like the idea of a military coup overthrowing a democratic government, even if they didn't like the government. And the U.S. had to back down because it was overthrown from within, and there was a big Latin American reaction. And U.S. intelligence surely knows that. So right at that point, what the U.S. turned to was subversion. Uh, we would consider it completely illegal if anybody else was doing it to us, as you read in that quote before. If some uh, official enemy was doing it, you know, they'd all be in jail. But we're carrying out. Uh, subversion in Venezuela to try to disrupt the government in any way possible, build up opposition to it. And if you want my speculation, and I have no direct evidence for this whatsoever, but just putting myself in the shoes of a uh, Pentagon planner who's been ordered by the White House to plan to get rid of this government, seems to me the logical thing for them to be trying to do would be to support a secessionist movement. And if you look at the of Venezuela, you can't imagine how that might work. Uh, there is a province, the Zulia province, which happens to be where a large part of the oil is. Uh, it's a rich, fairly rich province. It's anti-Chavez. It's right at the Colombian border. In Colombia is one of the few countries where the U.S. has, can have, if it wants, a secure military presence. Uh, there has been some talk of a, a Zulian independent secessionist movement. Uh, if the U.S., say the CIA, were to try to stimulate it, create some such movement, then claim to be moving in to defend it, you know, from the autocratic uh, tin pot dictator, you know, the rhetoric, uh, the brutal thug, as Nancy Pelosi called him, if they were to do that, well, you know, maybe they could get away with that. Uh, and that would, in fact, take a large part of the oil and uh, a majority of it, in fact, and uh, very seriously weaken Venezuela. Uh, and it would have support from the Colombian government and probably a few others around. Uh, maybe they could get away with that. That would, it's an ugly plan, but it's at least not, from their, from the point of view of planners, it's not insane. It might work. And so anyway, I wouldn't, wouldn't be much surprised if similar plans are, uh, underway for Bolivia and for Iran. Uh, in the case of Iran, uh, uh, invasion is out of the question. The U.S. doesn't have an army. and Carpet bombing of the country is possible from a distance. Uh, but it is conceivable that uh, they, there happens, it happens to be the case that, the, that Iranian oil is concentrated right at the Gulf, uh, right next to Iraq, uh, in a region which is largely Arab, not Persian, uh, Khuzestan. And it's conceivable that they might be trying to support a uh, Khuzestan, would be called an Ahwazi uh, liberation movement. Such a movement has already surfaced in uh, obscure and curious ways uh, to try to pull that region away from Iran and then just bomb the rest back to the Stone Age. That's, conceiv that's a conceivable military plan in Bolivia. Uh, which has enormous gas resources, they're in eastern Bolivia. Uh, that's a mostly kind of European sector. Uh, the population there doesn't like the majority Indian population, which has finally won democratic rights after 500 years and now runs the government. And it's and happens to be near Paraguay, another place where the U.S. could have military bases, maybe does. Uh, that would be a possible plan, too. I, it wouldn't surprise... I don't have... I repeat, I have no evidence for this. We have no evidence about what our government is doing. That's part of the goal of a government is to keep its population in ignorance. But if you speculate about what uh, rational and violent planners might be thinking, that seems to me it could be along these lines. Thanks for the call, Ricardo. We have full lines. Let's go to Joseph in San Francisco. Joseph, thank you for holding. Yes, good morning. Um, I'd like to mention a morally failed state, Israel, and since our time is very limited, I'd like to uh, quickly reference an article, Damage Control, Noam Chomsky and the Israel-Palestine Conflict by Jeffrey Blankford, available online. And my question for Professor Chomsky is, uh, Professor Chomsky, while you've been a critic of Israel, 
You seem to hold only the Gentile imperialists in Washington responsible for Israel's behavior. And I wonder why, as I understand it, you oppose our taking the Israel lobby to task and oppose our any kind of sanctions, boycotts, and economic uh, divestment campaigns against Israel, uh, as I understand it, saying that the majority there, the Zionist colonists, oppose it. You seem to oppose human rights activists from doing anything practical to hold Israel accountable, except for the vague advice to just write our congressperson. We didn't ask the colonist pressures in, uh, during South African apartheid if they would accept sanctions. Why do you seem to hold that position for Israel? Well, first of all, just about everything you said is false, so it's a little hard for me to respond to it. Uh, but let me just refer, respond to the boycott issue. It made a lot of sense to boycott South Africa uh, and to do sanctions, but that was after decades of educational and organizational activity which developed understanding here in the United States and in the West as to why that should be a reasonable proposal. Uh, furthermore, it was supported by uh, like 85% of the population in South Africa. But the, the crucial thing is here, there was understanding of it. I mean, you had uh, mayors getting arrested. Uh, you had business corporations supporting it. Yeah, that was an understandable position, and therefore it made sense to implement it. Let's take this proposal. Suppose we decide to boycott Israel. Suppose somebody announces that. It's hard to imagine a greater gift to George Bush and the Israeli right wing. Uh, because it will immediately, since since the background work has not been done, that's our fault, but it hasn't been done. Population wouldn't understand it. Can be immediate. It will be immediately interpreted. The few examples that have been tried have been interpreted this way, understandably, as just uh, you know a rise of anti-Semitism. They want to kill all the Jews. Uh, we have to strengthen uh, Israel. It has to destroy the Palestinians and so on. Yeah, if you want to give a gift to the ultra-right and the hardliners. That's one of the ways to do it. Remember, sanctions are a tactic, not a principle. They're a tactic. And tactics have to be judged in terms of their likely consequences, at least if you care anything about the victims. If you don't care about the victims and you just want to stand up on a pedestal and uh, you know beat your breast and say how wonderful I am, well, fine, and do whatever you like. But if you care about the victims, when you propose a tactic, you will consider what the likely consequences are going to be. And we know what they're like going to be right here. Uh, the, the, situa the, the background work that was done in the case of South Africa has not been done. The understanding is not there. Support is not there. And furthermore, if we're serious and we want to impose sanctions, they should be imposed on the United States. Uh, why is Israel a huge military power? Not because it's a powerful country. It's because you and I pay for it with our taxes. Uh, and uh, you and I provide the diplomatic and uh, economic and military support for its uh, atrocities like the war in Lebanon. So, yeah, you want to impose sanctions. Uh, go back to the source. Well, Professor Chomsky, let's talk about some realistic tactics when it comes to Israel-Palestine. There's a report today in Reuters um, in which UN Human Rights Envoy uh, John Dugard said that Israel has turned the Gaza Strip into a prison for Palestinians where life is, quote, intolerable, appalling, and tragic. He says that in other countries, this process might be described as ethnic cleansing, but political correctness forbids such language where Israel is concerned. So, Realistically speaking, with the current power structure that we have now with uh, Ehud Olmert, Bush and Cheney and then Blair really not really speaking out on this issue at all. Um, what in your mind or, or some what is a realistic tactic when it comes Very to Israel and realistic Palestine? Tactic is to change U.S. government policy. That's the core of it. Yes, what he described is a tiny fraction of the atrocities going on in the Gaza Strip. I mean, if you want, we can go through the actual story, which is much worse. And it's going on because it is supported by the United States. It is supported by the U.S. media. Uh, let, let's just take the latest escalation in the Gaza Strip. The latest escalation was on June 25th. June 25th, Hamas captured an Israeli soldier, Hilad Shalit. Uh, immediately after that, Israel sharply stepped up its attacks in the Gaza Strip. Uh, the number of people killed, which was already high, quadrupled in the next month. By now, it's risen to over 250 since then. Uh, 
how is it treated in the United States? Well, I know how the I don't read the San Francisco Chronicle, but I bet it was like everywhere else. Uh, just like the Boston Globe, probably the most liberal paper in the country, the New York Times. Uh, the, this was regarded as legitimate retaliation to an intolerable crime by Hamas capturing a soldier. They may say, well, it's a little too extreme or disproportionate, but of course, after a soldier's captured, what else can you do? Did they report the fact that one day before on June 24th, Israeli forces had committed a much worse crime. They had kidnapped two civilians in Gaza. Kidnapping civilians is a far more serious crime than capture of a soldier, particularly a soldier of an army that's attacking Gaza. Uh, you might argue that's not a crime at all. But kidnapping civilians is a very severe crime. These are the Muammar brothers. They were brought to uh, Israel, which is illegal as well, uh, sent off into the prison system where they join roughly a thousand others uh, who are under what's called administrative detention, which means kidnapped. Uh, there are others who are brought illegally from the West Bank in violation of international law. Uh, it's not that this is unknown. In fact, there was limited reporting of this. Uh, the Los Angeles Times had a short article about it. Uh, Washington Post had 87 words. It was reported, it was known, but dismissed. Because when our side commits major crimes, it's not a crime. Uh, when the enemy, uh, the ones we're attacking, commit a much less crime, then the hue and cry is uh, up to the heavens, and we have to support a violent attack. All right, that tells you the answer to your question. The problem is right here. Well, Until we can develop the kind of understanding and consciousness that will not permit our own media, our own intellectuals, our own government to act this way, yeah, then the atrocities will continue. Well, how do you change U.S. policy when, when in this country we haven't even had a substantial debate about the war? And I'm not talking just on people who oppose the war, but I'm talking at, at the political level. Yeah, the way you do it is exactly the way everything else is achieved. Um, just take recent years. Uh, how were women's rights achieved? Um, there's been a huge improvement in women's rights in the last uh, 40 years. How about minority rights? Uh, how about uh, opposition to war and aggression? Uh, how about the support for uh, what are called welfare state measures? How was any of this achieved? By, con by committed, dedicated action, day by day, day after day, small-scale organizing, consciousness raising, uh, you know, demonstrations, uh, uh, meetings, uh, political protests, running candidates. I mean, we have the whole gamut of possibilities open to us if we want to carry them out. Uh, but you have to do it. On the other hand, to go back to the other question, uh, print, uh, declaring uh, some tactic which is sure to be a gift to the right wing is not the way to do it. Uh, the way to do it, we know, it's been achieved in other cases, can be achieved in this case. I mean, I just tell you my own experience. Uh, just in this last week, it happens that I've given two big talks exactly on this issue, on Palestinians, on Gaza, on the destruction of Lebanon, and so on. Huge audiences, a lot of support. Uh, these are the kinds of things, this is, happens to be right around here, right around Boston, Massachusetts, you know, the Athens of America, supposedly. Uh, these are the kind of things I could not have said 10 years ago without police protection. I mean, there were underground police in Cambridge. If I tried to talk about Palestinian issues, well, it's changed. Now there's a big audience, not just here, but all over the country, if you want to do it. If the people who are willing to go out and try to, I mean, there are plenty of people willing to hear, willing to be organized, willing to do something, but somebody's got to do something about it. It doesn't happen by itself. I'm wondering, do you ever venture out and, and go into the more conservative states oh, and, yeah. and talk to audiences? And, and what kind of reception are you receiving now? Are you seeing a change? Oh, an enormous change. I mean, just uh, not that long ago, I was uh, giving a talk right at the Idaho-Washington border. It's probably one of the most conservative places in the country. All you see when you drive around is uh, National Rifle Association signs and Christian evangelical churches. I think there were about 4,000 people coming from rural Idaho and uh, Washington. Again, in, you know, maybe they didn't agree, doesn't matter. Engaged, enthusiastic, interested, want to stick around for long discussions. Uh, I mean, I was on their local NPR station 
saying things that I could never say on national NPR. Hmm. That's all, and it's all over the country. Look, a few months ago, I happened to be giving a talk in West Point. Well, it was serious. It had a thousand cadets out, a lot of officers. Uh, serious discussion. You know, a lot of. You know, I'm sure they don't agree with a lot of it, or maybe most of it. But it was a serious, honest discussion. Better than the kind that I could have at the uh, um, Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Hmm. That's interesting. It'd be interesting to read about your experiences in those areas. Let's go to some more calls. Adrian in San Francisco. Adrian, welcome to the show. Good morning, Rose. Uh, good morning, Professor Chomsky. I don't know if you remember me. My name is Adrian Maldonado. We shared a correspondence while I was a resident at the Lanch Street Foundation, and I wanted to thank you for your time. Thank you. You helped me quite a bit with uh, my teaching there. And I just wanted to bring up three points I think you make that are really important in the, in the realm of Cuba, Venezuela, even Iran. Those are examples, and that's why the U.S. power and the elites so oppose them. They're examples of alternative ways to deal with economies, to deal with society in which you know, finance and capital is preeminent. And then you make some good points as well as organizing. It's really hard work. I'm involved with labor. I'm involved with the anti-war movement. And it's hard work. And I think sometimes if I learned anything at the Lancet Street, it was to learn to kind of defer gratification and put in the hard work that's necessary to build organizations, to, to build people up, to get people engaged, whether they agree with you or not. They start talking about it. They realize the American people can do a lot. We're a lot smarter than our government gives us credit for, and we're a lot more willing to put in the work, but, but it takes people to help, and it's cooperative, and, and they would rather have us just buy Nikes and iPods, and then just every four years go through the formality of saying we're in a democracy. And the professor is right. Most of the rest of the world has been at the other end of a club, and it's usually been the United States club. And so their view of things is different, and the way that they look at history tends to be a little closer to the truth. So I thank the professor. I, I've been putting up hegemony survival for the last year, and have not gotten the reference uh, the reaction Mr. Chavez did. And of course, he probably has a lot more charisma than Adrian, I Adrian, Adrian, I hate to cut you off. We have a bunch more callers. Do you thank have you. A, a question for Professor Chomsky? No, I just wanted to thank him. Go on with the continuation. Okay. okay. Thank thanks, thanks, thanks for your call, much. Adrian. I appreciate that. And I think your point is right. Uh, that's how things change, just the way you're doing it. It's not easy, but we're not facing torture chambers and secret police. Yeah, we got a lot of opportunities, but you have to do it. Thanks for the call, Adrian. Let's go to Ira in San Francisco. Ira, good morning. Hello? Let's go to John in San Francisco. John, welcome. Uh, yes. Uh, hello, uh, Professor Chomsky. Um, I think that anybody at this particular time can see that... Uh, we have a, uh, a media that's hijacked by subgroups and organizations, uh, and I'd like your feeling on, uh, or your suggestion on, how do we go about getting back our free and democratic uh, media so we can get real information and not have these extreme biases uh, that, are, that are being hijacked by uh, people with other agendas? Well, first of all, I think we ought to be careful about the history. Uh, the last time we had really free and independent media was probably in the 19th century, middle and late 19th century. At that point, there was a wide variety of media representing all sorts of groups, uh, ethnic groups, uh, working class groups, uh, others. Uh, a lot of participation, a lot of interest, uh, very widely read and very diverse and lively and exciting. Uh, that was a be free media system. Uh, but things have changed over the past century and a half. Uh, media have been concentrated. Uh, capital concentration became enormous, uh, which means you can't start new media. I think the last new daily series journal in the United States was maybe almost a century ago. Uh, the country moved from a more or less market society to a a uh, centralized, a society with highly centralized power, economic power, corporate power, uh, substantial state involvement in the economy, and close linkage between them. One of the consequences of that, or the correlates of it, is that media became advertiser supported, not supported by the readers, but supported by the advertisers. So when you buy your daily newspaper, they're not making any money. They're probably losing money. Uh, they are sell you, the reader of a newspaper is being sold by a corporation to an, other businesses, 
That's the economic structure of the media. Huge corporations selling readers to other businesses. Uh, and that has a very harmful effect on media content. It means they reflect very much the interests of the owners, uh, the buyers, other businesses, and for the elite newspapers, like, say, the New York Times, uh, the uh, privileged audiences that they largely appeal to. That's a very narrow sector. And, sure, that leads to very significant biases. I've written extensively about it, so have others. Uh, Robert McChesney has a very good recent book called The Problem of the Media. He's a very good media scholar, which goes through the history and talks about how it's developed and so on. So winning back our free media is mostly an illusion. To my, in my opinion, I've been following media pretty closely for, you know, 60 years. Uh, I think the media are about as free now as they've, as they've been in my lifetime, in many ways more free. Um, there are many things you can... Uh, for example, there are major illusions about the media in the Vietnam War. The media were not critical of the Vietnam War. That is simply untrue. I cannot recall one reference in the last 45 years to the fact that the United States invaded South Vietnam, although it certainly did in 1962. Uh, the media became what is called critical of the war when it started to get too costly for us. Again, there's a few exceptions, but the main thrust of the media was we're not winning, it's too costly uh, therefore, to us, therefore it's no good. That was what was called criticism. It's very much like the criticism of the Iraq war today. Uh, there's no criticism of the fact that uh, we carried out aggression against uh, Iraq, the supreme crime of Nuremberg, for which the civilian leadership was hanged. We carried it out, and we are therefore responsible for all the crimes that follow. That was the Nuremberg judgment. Have you read that anywhere? No, the only question is, uh, well, we don't seem to be getting anywhere. It's a quagmire. It's costing us too much and so on. That's kind of like the uh, Russian press uh, in, in the 1980s about Afghanistan. Um, they were critical, too. This is, this is crazy. Russian soldiers are being killed. Uh, it's costing us a lot. Why should we bother and so on? Uh, do we call that criticism in Pravda? No. We call it support of state violence. And that's the way it is now, and that's the way it was in the 1960s. What's called criticism in elite circles is mostly support. Uh, so we should stop illusions about the past. The media did improve, in my opinion, from the 1960s. But that's for the same reason the whole society became more civilized as in the things I mentioned, like, say, women's rights and so on. Society became more civilized because of popular activism, which had effects. I mean, even in totalitarian states, it has effects, and certainly in more democratic societies. One effect was on the media. Now, the media began to draw from people who came out of the activist movements of the 60s. They became journalists, so they moved up, they introduced their perspective. There was a big struggle against it an effort to try to stop it, but it goes on, and it made the media somewhat more free and responsive. You want to make the media even better, have more significant popular activism. Thanks for the call. Let's go to Harry in San Francisco. Harry, thank you for holding. Hi, yes, good morning, Professor Chomsky. Uh, in today's Wall Street Journal, there's uh, the um, sort of praising attack on you by one Roger Scruton called if only Chomsky had stunk the stuck to syntax, and uh, we don't really have a whole time to get into the whole thing, but uh, I was wondering if you had seen it, and uh, if his allegations that you supported regimes that no one could endorse in retrospect, like that of Pol Pot, uh, is actually true that you were a supporter of Pol Pot? I've read that, too. I don't have to bother reading his article. I've read other things of his. He knows perfectly well that it's a pure lie. Uh, I was a harsh critic of the Pol Pot regime. Uh, what I criticized and what the Wall Street Journal can't stand is the fact that there were huge government lies about it and, and, and media lies. Uh, the state had announced that this is an enemy. So therefore, people like Roger Scruton and, in fact, across the board, uh, the Washington Post, the others, uh, produced incredible lies. What I said, and my colleague Edward Herman said, and you can read it, it's in print, is yes, it's a hideous regime, it's carrying out terrible atrocities, but we ought to tell the truth. 
We ought to tell the truth both about the regime and about the atrocities that led to it. Remember, from 1969 to 1975, the United States was intensively bombing Cambodia. In fact, the intensity of the bombing was kept secret. It's only very recently been released that it was about five times the level of what it was said to be. There's a serious study of this by a leading Cambodia scholar, Ben Kiernan, head of the Genocide Project at Yale, a new article in which he using new government documents. Yeah, there was a very intensive bombing, much worse than we knew about. And yeah, it helped mobilize the Khmer Rouge. Uh, then when they came into power, they committed tremendous atrocities, as I wrote and as the editors of the Wall Street Journal know and as Scruton knows. Though I, we did, my colleague and I, Edward Herman, say, let's keep to the truth instead of acting like Stalinists and uh, uh, inventing fabrications to support state policy. Furthermore, it goes on, uh, and this is another reason why I'm hated on this, uh, toward the end of the Pol Pot rule, the United States started tilting towards Pol Pot when the Vietnamese government overthrew the Pol Pot regime. Just as its atrocities were peaking, the U.S. turned to attacking the Vietnamese, the Prussians of Asia, for daring to end Pol Pot's atrocities. And the U.S. and Britain immediately turned to supporting Pol Pot. Uh, they insisted that he get the, uh, that the Khmer Rouge, called Democratic Kampuchea, get the a seat in the United Nations. They began supporting them militarily to attack the government. They put Vietnam under harsh sanctions for daring to end Pol Pot's atrocities. They supported, as the Carter regime, supported a Chinese invasion to punish Vietnam for ridding the country of Pol Pot. And we also condemned that and on. Uh, and that is intolerable. For people like Roger Scruton and the editors of the Wall Street Journal, you are supposed to be loyal Stalinists. You follow the party line, you accept the lies, you suppress the uh, the truths that are unacceptable, and if you don't do that, you become a supporter of Pol Pot. Yeah, that's their line. I mean, the Wall Street Journal is maybe a little unusual in that they are one of the rare journals that won't even accept a brief letter uh, pointing out that an article by their slanders by their editors are pure fabrications. They won't even accept it, even acknowledge it. But yeah, this is normal. That's what you expect in the uh, in the sectors of the of the society that really take Stalinist Russia as their models. Harry, thanks for the call, Professor Chomsky. We just have a few minutes left, and I'm wondering, in reading your your new book, Failed States, and in a, in a number of your other books, not all thirty, <laughs> but um, is there a particular? I'm just thinking, you know, when you when you look at what's going on in the world um, in your free time, if you have much of it, is there a specific topic right now or place in the world that you tend to spend more of your focus on? Well, I my focus of my you know, I, I'm giving constant talks and interviews and meetings and so on and so forth. And it tends to focus on what are the most urgent crises. I mean, not entirely. Talk about other things, too. But right now, it happens that the most urgent, imminent crises are around the Middle East. Now, it's very possible that the U.S. is gearing up to a war with Iran. Uh, the world is overwhelmingly opposed to it. As far as we we can tell, the U.S. military and intelligence are opposed. They don't speak very openly, but it appears so. In fact, about the only support for it is a narrow sector of extremists in the White House and probably the Wall Street Journal editors and a couple of others like them. That, but they may do it. If they do it, it have unpredictable effects. I mean, conceivably, they'll get away with it. Maybe Hitler could have gotten away with it two-front war, who knows. Uh, but the chances are it could be a major catastrophe uh, for the United States, for the region, for the United States, for the world. And that's why, as I was starting to say before, even Iran's neighbors, who don't like Iran at all, uh, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, the populations much prefer Iranian nuclear weapons to any military action. They don't want Iran to have nuclear weapons, neither do I, neither should anyone. But they'd prefer that to any military action. Those are its neighbors. Nevertheless, these guys might carry it off. Professor Chomsky, do you vote? If there's anything, depends. <laughs> I mean, in, in a state like Massachusetts where the outcome is predicted, you know, I vote for, say, a green candidate or something. In a swing state in the last election, I probably would have voted against Bush. 
which and, forces you to vote for Kerry. Right. And then we have about 30 seconds left. Um, you've written 30 books in 30 years. You constantly give talks. Uh, you remain very positive. Um, how, do you, how do you find balance in your life? It's because, for one thing, because you really have no choice. I mean, even if I was the only person in the world who thought this, I'd continue to go on. But the point is, there is a very substantial and growing uh, uh, population in the United States, and in fact elsewhere in the world, who is extremely dissatisfied with what's happening, wants to do something about it, and is able to be, is interested in becoming engaged and mobilized. That's a very optimistic sign. Another optimistic sign is that we happen to have enormous freedom and privilege by comparative standards. It wasn't a gift from above. It was won from below by popular, hard popular struggle, just in the way one of the earlier callers mentioned. But it was won. We have that legacy. We can decide to use it. We can decide to abandon it. That's our choice. If Professor Chomsky, it, there are plenty of opportunities. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah. Noam Chomsky is author of the new book, Failed States, The Abuse of Power and the Assault on Democracy.